one being signed up. And that's it. For, we used to have a overall team of $150. Now it's $10 per individual that registered. That $10 goes towards your team goal. Can you repeat the date of the launch? May 19th, 10 a.m. May 20th, 10 a.m. Not feel high traffic. Thank you, ladies. Very much for the call. Uh, before we go any further, I just want to mention that with the fans that we have in the back, it's creating a bit of a buzz and a little difficult to hear sometimes. So, uh, anybody that comes to the podium, uh, make sure that you speak in the mic so that we can hear. Alright, the next thing we have appointments. Uh, we have a mayor, you have a couple of appointments. To the planning commission and to the library board. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Council, um, tonight I'm bringing forth um, a new appointment to the Planning Commission. As you know, we had a commissioner who um, retired after a very long time of service. And I'm excited to bring a, a young person and a new addition to our community who contacted um, the city wanting to get involved. She is so you can see, um, she is a practicing attorney. In our last resignation from the board was also an attorney, and we still have been in the position complimenting the board, and I would ask for approval. I move appointment to the appointment of Emma Dillard. Emma Dillard, please come to the planning committee. We have a motion uh, by Mr. Uh, Cyber, supported by Mr. Frazier, to appoint Ms. Robin Miller to the Planning Commission. All in favor? Aye. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Jordan. Okay. I did have a question uh, here, uh, Mr. Chairman. I know that you have been in the city for less than a year. Do you feel that you can get them and say something? Give me some assurances. Not a problem. Um, I'm actually, I've actually been in Southfield for over a year now. I moved to Southfield in February of last year, so it's been a little over a year. Um, as Mayor Lawrence indicated, I contacted the city initially because I was really interested in getting involved. Um, a friend of mine actually serves on the library board as well. So I was looking to, I guess, get my talent from board leadership to the city of Southfield, and this was a great opportunity for me. So yes, I feel as a new resident, I can step in. I work in Oakland County. I now live in Oakland County. I'm specifically Southfield, so I think that this would be a great opportunity for me to at least get some service at where I live. Um, I would like to now also um, add to the um, to the reappointments for tonight. The library board, Dr. Um, McCullen, who, whom we all know, who has served on the um, Dr. McCullen has served on the library board for a number of years, and we are asking for her reappointment tonight to the library board. Ms. McCullen, would you please? Madam Chair? I move that we reappoint Dr. McCullen to the library board.
raise your right hand, please. Do you hereby swear or affirm that you will support the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of this state, and the South Coast City Charter, and that you will faithfully perform the duties to the board or commission to which you are just appointed to in accordance with the South Coast County of Baltimore, State of Michigan, according to the best of your ability? Elizabeth Bill, Pennsylvania, for a specially equipped and designed replacement vehicle 
service to today's needs of the City General Control Program. This replacement of the former vehicle, which was a 2002 reconfigured cargo van with 96,000 miles, which does not meet the current demand for the animal control function in the city. The replacement is approved in 2011-2012 budget in the amount of $50,000. And that cost of the replacement vehicle is anticipated to be at least 10000 below budget when including the estimated salvage value of the formal vehicle of $1,500-$2,000 and any insurance proceeds that may be to the city for recent damage done to the vehicle in an accident. Item D is the award of bid to Louis Landscaping of Brown Town, Michigan in the amount of $24,956.16 less 2% comp payment discount for weeding, mowing, edging, and fertilizing services for a total of nine high visibility roadside areas that require specialized attention for community appearance purposes. Funds are provided for this item in the 2011-2012 Streets and Highways budget and will be provided in future budgets as council may approve. Item E is awarded there to Wolverine Freightliner in Ypsilanti, Michigan in the total amount of $442,737 for three replacement dump trucks. The units being replaced were put into service in 1998. The average useful life of these trucks is 10 years. Thus, the trucks being replaced are approaching functional obsolescence. Funds are provided in the 2011-2012 budget for this purpose. Item F is awarded bid in the amount of $240,963 for eight police vehicles, four canine vehicles, and four marked patrol units, $128,091 for five street and highway work trucks, $75,373 for three water and sewer work trucks, $32,776 for two building department cargo vans for inspections equipped with ladders and other equipment, $20,499 for one facility's maintenance cargo van, and $29,437 for one work truck to be assigned to the motor pool. The total award for the 2011-2012 budget replacement purchases is $525,139. $125,139,000. Based on low bids of three Michigan dealers, Red Holman of Westland, Gorno Ford of Woodhaven, and Shaheen Chevrolet of Lansing. All of these work units and equipment are housed at the City of Southfield. Item G is authorization for the Mayor and City Clerk to sign an agreement with SMART in the amount of $2,500 to provide bike racks at various locations in the municipal complex and the city center district subject to review and approval of the agreement as performed by the city attorney's office. Item H is the request for council to adopt the annual standard resolution permitting our public works employees to enter and work within property belonging to the Michigan Department of Transportation. Such work primarily involves water main and sewer line repair and maintenance functions. This resolution has been reviewed and approved as performed by the city attorney's office. Item I is the request for authority to accept a grant awarded to the city in the amount of $25,290 by the U.S. Department of Justice. This funding is requested to be used to purchase crime news software from the Omega, Omega Group of San Diego, California in the amount of $28,100 with the city providing $2,810 in matching funds. This software provides for real-time crime analysis and mapping, aiding the police department in crime prevention and community policing. The grant award and its proposed use were reviewed at the March 5th Committee of the Whole meeting. Item J is approval to utilize the $12,818 in earmarked funds donated by the Knights of Columbus and set aside for the therapeutic program for special needs adults within the city. The Parks and Recreation Department has provided a 10-point plan for these funds to provide exercise programs, field trips, recreational outings, and field trips for these residents. Items K, L, and M involve official acceptance of county, state, and federal grant funds which support the outstanding work of the Southfield Career Center, including job skills training and job placement. These grants total $2.6 million and serve unemployed or underemployed Southfield residents as well as area businesses seeking trained employees. It is anticipated that the Career Center will receive additional funding in the next quarter that will bring the total funding to the currently budgeted total of $3.3 million for the 2011-2012 fiscal year. Okay. Um, Ms. Jordan? Can I have item um, A, J, and I think that's the question that we're going to include. What is the item again? Uh, that's C and J. C and J? I'd like to move the consent agenda A through I and K through M. Of course. C and J. 
today will be um, removed. Um, there's a motion by Mr. Savage, supported by Mr. Frazier. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, motion has carried. And um, who's going to speak for that? Yes. Um, Mr. <coughs> you know, I'm looking at um, the money that are being spent for the handicap program. Can you give me a little bit more detail as to if these equipment are going to be at Beachwood, if it's going to be here? Just a little bit more information on Yes, so uh, through the chair, I'd like to call on uh, a block, Parks and Recreation, uh, who has detail on this. Uh, as the item indicates, the source of funding uh, is uh, $12,818 donated through the Knights of Columbus and uh, earmarked uh, for this purpose. Uh, but uh, Doug Block has the detail uh, on where the equipment uh, will be located in the programs as well. Thank you. Good evening, Council Madam Mayor, Mr. Charette, through the chair. There's a program that are paid right here on the site.
Uh, the plan also includes the required bike rack and pedestrian connections to the public sidewalk along Telegraph Road to the restaurant itself. When this project was before the Planning Commission, concerns were raised by the adjacent property or a conjoint, uh, as well as the tenant IAC, uh, regarding the view of the re new restaurant and drive through from their office to the conference room on the first floor. Uh, Wendy's has worked with the Joyen, IAC, and the planning department to provide additional screenings along the common property line, which includes a new six foot high screen wall, black moon fencing, and new landscaping. Uh, the Joyen and IAC have agreed to that screening along the property line, and that is shown on uh, the landscape plan and site plan that's in your packet this evening. Uh, the other item of concern uh, has to do with noise from the order box. Uh, equipment is being used uh, nowadays in you know, digital form, uh, much wider than the old uh, model use, and uh, therefore the issue with uh, <coughs> regard to noise is uh, not a real big issue. Uh, at the Council Site Plan Committee meeting, the committee expressed concerns about the amount of landscaping along the Telegraph Road front. Uh, since that meeting, uh, the petitioner has increased his landscaping from what was 9 feet wide to a 16 foot wide landscape bed and uh, has moved the bike rack further back from the telegraph road sidewalk. Uh, there was also a question with regard to the ability for a fire truck to get around the site. Uh, fire prevention has re-reviewed that plan and uh, the, with the additional landscape added and they have submitted an approval letter as part of your tax. Um, just as a note, uh, there's been a lot of activity in this particular section of telegraph road. This would actually make the fourth uh, redevelopment project within that particular area in the last couple of years. We do have a short video for you.
50 jobs or 25 if they're high tech jobs. Um, this program is not available for retention jobs and is performance based. Um, CFI was eligible to receive some of this, some of these dollars, and we'll, we'll explain that in a minute. But contingent upon them receiving incentives from the state, the city must provide some local support. So CFI is um, planning on making a $1.2 million capital investment at this location. So they'll be receiving $434,500 in credits from the Michigan, or in dollars from the MEDC. This equates to $5,500 per <coughs> job created. And the city is looking to um, offer a 3% match to this incentive. The, the company is making a $575,000 investment in new personal property over the next three years. And so at this time, we're requesting to abate the three years taxes, which will total $12,244. And here's a breakout of their annual investment and the impact it'll have on the city of Southfield. Um, as you can see, currently, CFI does pay taxes to the city of Southfield, um, totaling about $12,500. They will continue to make that investment in the city, um, and then after year four, the dollars that will be abated will be co collected back into the system. So the, the payback is quite quick on this investment, and the city is asking to be a partner with CFI. Um, as a impact of the city of Southfield, there's the direct contribution of jobs and, and future tax revenues, but I think equally important are all the indirect benefits. Um, with this uh, proposal, um, I, I'm confident we can add at least 79 jobs, that's what we've committed to, and, and frankly, I think the number will exceed that pretty considerably. Um, we're making very material financial investments in this uh, uh, project, uh, and I think the other indirect benefits with this being our headquarters operation and us building this development center here, um, we'll actually have uh, tremendous indirect benefits with the local businesses. Uh, for example, we have our company events where our employee concentration is the greater. So once a year we bring the entire company in from around the country and take over the Western <coughs> and Southfield. Uh, we use multiple local uh, restaurants and, and uh, catering services for all of our company training and, and meetings. We use um, United Healthcare in Southfield. We use uh, Jaffe, a law firm. We continue to use local resources everywhere we can uh, just to solidify our position in this market. Again, um, we are looking to be a partner with CSI. We're very excited that they're staying at the IBM building. Um, the Cornerstone Development Authority is working hard to make improvements in wonderful companies like CSI are really making an impact in the community. Um, and they will be working with the Southfield Career Center to fill these positions. Thank you. Can you uh, One other comment on the positions we're adding. Um, the, the type of positions we're adding are, are very high demand in the marketplace. And uh, part of the reason for the investment is we have to, to do a several month training program on these resources. So uh, these are not only high paying jobs when they start, uh, they have a very rapid um, uh, advancement in terms of their salary and compensation, which also provides the additional benefits as well. All right, thank you. Did you have something else I just want to make one more comment. On the resolution that's prepared, the <coughs> inadvertently the wrong date was put on there, and so I want paragraph three, the third area, to reflect today's date. Of the resolution that won't match. The second line. Oh, I Mark Adams from Oakland County is also present, as well as Alice Savas from the, the CDA. It's um, it was interesting. I have first been here, and would be happy to answer any other questions you have about the company or how we're I, I do appreciate your consideration. We might want to ask them after the time to wait to come from the county. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, we'll uh, call upon them possibly after the public hearing. Thank you. I will declare the public hearing on item 
and in the city of Chicago and New York, New York, which is where I'm originally from, I guarantee, and I could be wrong, that you didn't get a tax abatement in New York, New York, and that you did not get a tax abatement in Illinois. You also have 20 other offices in 20 other states. And I'm just trying to figure out why is it so important to get $12,244 from the residents in this city? I think it's just asinine. I don't always agree with the mayor, but the mayor talked about some things that we need to do in terms of structural things. We've got an ice arena that Little Caesars had at one time, and they give it back to the city. And a lot of repairs that need to be done in the city. You can go to 12,244 of your employees and get a dollar from each one of them and not even have to ask the residents here or ask the council for this particular tax abatement. I'm, I'm really upset about the fact that you would even come here and ask for that. I'm also going to talk about the fact that this city has pending tax appeals that could potentially cost this city, in terms of dollars, $124 million. Now, if I was your client, Mr. CFI, and I said in order for me to do business with you, I needed to say $12,244, would you give me the price break? Thank you very much. And we have an African American Chamber of Commerce in the city. A further chair, if I might comment. Madam President, the, the, the number that was given for the tax appeals and the cost they could possibly uh, amount to in the city is an inaccurate number. That number is under the, the, the exact uh, uh, implications of tax appeals is under review, but it is nowhere near that magnitude. Thank you. This um, Gerald might be citing the, the city ordinance. However, the industrial development district that we are asking to be put in place is Public Act 198. That was like so it's not the same thing. Um, this is Mr. Bunker, please. I'm going to adjust for the record of your time. My name is Fred Bunker. My address is 24201 Gardner Street. I've had a lot of experience with tax abatement. Uh, as a as a beneficiary of the way they're kind of given the key to the city in a way that hopefully this new enterprise will not. The tax abatement recipients are allowed to trample over zoning ordinances like recently when Maxitrol, the current tax abatement recipient, bought residential property bordering my own. We've seen a history where these tax abatement recipients use their found money, if you will, money they don't use to pay what we have to call fair share in America. Everybody pays their fair share and we pay for democracy. Otherwise, we fall short. So if you want to choose the people that are going to pay less, <laughs> make it your prerogative and make yourself <coughs> into a kingdom where this goes on. We don't support it. The residents of this city don't support what you do when you give a token gesture <laughs> like this to people who laugh it off. And businessman lunches. The property next door to me was zoned R1 when I went to Florida on the need to leave. And when I came back, it was owned by a tax abatement recipient who less than a year previously had been offered the same kind of incentive to control a piece of property on the east side of Telegraph. My home is at the entryway of what is as heavy an industrial zone that you'll find, including the traffic created by a, a school that the, the way it was built is not right. And, and we've been left in an R1 zone that has no, no reality and a basis of the quality of life we've been left with. And now they have tax abatement dollars funding the purchase of my neighbor's home, literally, I think. I can 
make that statement because they didn't pay its fair share to support democracy. They used the money saved to buy my neighbor's house. The neighbor who died while waiting to get answers from the same city council about where our one zoning begins and the rights of residents versus tax abatement recipients and what they're able to do with the money you give them and allow them to invest where they will, whether it's residential property or on uh, what are known as items of real property and desks and tables as we hear, the millions of dollars they need to invest. My neighbor's property they picked up for $40,000. They're undermining the democratic underpinning of the tax structure in this city by buying out residential based tax property and turning it into tax abatement owned property. I'm told by the planning department that's their solution for rezoning Garner is to have me, as Mr. Trout advised me, seemingly an agent of this abatement recipient, Maxitrol. He's telling me, advising me, that the council's not going to take his recommendations for rezoning Garner, but it's up to me to sell my property to these losers who got a tax abatement because we all went along, like we always do, Mr. Cyber. Your, 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 your wrangle at a resident who su they suggested that you vote in the affirmative for tax abatements is in accordance with the record here. You've never opposed a tax abatement. And for you to bristle at the idea he suggested that you were, your vote was known prior to the actual vote, I, I took personal umbrage to that uh, choice you made in pinpointing him out. And again, I'll be back to discuss this at length again. Tax abatements are a bad thing. Everybody needs to pay their fair share or the country goes work in the same direction it's been headed to through this administration's uh, direction. And I apologize for being a part of it. Thank you, Mr. Hunger. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak to this issue? Please come forward. Thank you, Mr. Hunger, for the record, and you have five minutes to begin with me. Good evening, Madam Mayor. City Council. My name is Mark Adams. I'm with Oakland County Economic Development. The address is 2100 Pontiac Lake Road. And I have the pleasure of working with Computer Ride Facility Integration along with the State of Michigan and the City of uh, South Philly Economic Development Department. And I can tell you from the very beginning of this project, when I was first contacted about it and brought the team together, that it was a very competitive situation between company expanding here in Michigan or in Nevada. It wasn't a situation where he was left to close up his business and leave Southfield. It was an opportunity for the state of Michigan and the city of Southfield to compete for an expansion. And we, we are really blessed to have a company like this, to have this type of corporate footprint that will hire folks with a very decent wage that could buy a house, support a family, support a school district, and to have that type of technology and, again, corporate footprint in Southfield, I think is, is a blessing in these times. And the fact of the matter is, is that this company is actually taking extra space in the IBM building and providing a benefit to the community Whereas all over the state of Michigan, uh, there's vacancy rates that are very, very high. We're in a very competitive situation for these types of expansions, and we need to do everything that we possibly can to keep these types of expansions and job opportunities here in the state of Michigan. It was a very exhaustive process that we go through now under the new governor for these types of incentives for businesses. It wasn't anything that was just um, you know, cooked up as an opportunity to take advantage of something. There was a business case that had to be presented with facts and figures that were hard and fast between the state of Michigan and Nevada in order for this expansion to take place um, here in Southfield. So basically, it's, it's a win-win situation for the business and for the state of Michigan and the city of Southfield. With all the vacancy being taken up, new job opportunities, uh, the, the use of our hotels and restaurants in the area, and in light of the fact 
districts and some of the uh, uh, notifications that we got recently about businesses not uh, uh, staying here in the state of Michigan and the city of Southfield, we need to be doing everything that we can, making that strong business case, to keep every business opportunity that we possibly can here in the state of Michigan and the city of uh, Southfield. So those are really the, the facts of the matter. And I hope that you would have approved this abatement and um, accept this expansion into our uh, community. Thank you, Mr. Evans. I was going to call on you later. Thank you. Muriel Swigel, 17015 North Washington. I am a 47-year member city of Southfield, glad to live here, and wish to stay here, but I don't want to see buildings closed and closed and closed. Our forefathers, who started this city, always thought about what? Office buildings, office buildings, and office buildings. And what do we have today? Many empty office buildings. By giving tax abatements, we can help to revive this city again and make it the real South Bend, that when I moved here was a growing city and it was going places. And we'd like to see it go places again. Thank you, Ms. Jordan. Anyone else? Well, I do have a chance when I close the public oh, hearing to talk with you. Yeah, to I to go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I just want to clarify some of the things that were stated. I, I think some of the um, uh, positive attributes are certainly, I would agree with, uh, uh, just some of the clarification points, some of the comments made. We are not a billion dollar company. Uh, we, we've done this for a billion square feet of client facilities. We're a small business with 110 employees. We're talking about adding 80 employees. So that's a very material investment for us over the next several years. Um, second, we've never threatened to leave the city of Southfield or made any types of threats. Our headquarters in Southfield it has been for 20 years. Uh, we have no intention of, of changing that. This is about adding a new development center with a concentration of, of specialized resources. We have to hire and train those resources. The group that, uh, this is a product line from IBM, and that group is headquartered out of Las Vegas, Nevada, just outside of Las Vegas, Nevada. That's where the training is available. That's where most of the trained staff are available. That they have, uh, Nevada has also offered a very material incentive program for us to add those jobs there. Uh, that, in fact, I was surprised when I put the math together how compelling the case was to go there. So this is not a threat of any kind. This is just making it competitive with, with uh, the other opportunity, which would be to put that same group of new hires in Nevada instead of putting them in, in Michigan. Again, no threats were ever made. Our headquarters will remain here. This is about adding this new development center. Um, what else? Um, oh, in terms of our other operations, we do have operations in a couple of cities, not 20 other cities. We have physical offices in uh, New York and Chicago. We do business in 20 some states, and we have staff working out of home offices in, in 20 states. The intent here is to build a concentration of resources somewhere, and again, we'd like to stop building. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Madam Mayor, honorable members of council, my name is Alan Southers. I'm the executive director of the DDA. I'd just like to make a, a couple of points, if I may. First of all, this deal was presented to our DDA board at our last board meeting, and they were 100% in support of the uh, of uh, CFI's operation and the tax base. As you know, one of the challenges that we have in the DDA is the abundance of office space and the vacancy rate that is currently there. Um, obviously losing or having the opportunity to lose CFI um, certainly would hurt us, would cripple us. The 79 jobs that CFI is looking to, to hire will go a long way in representing and helping the restaurants as an example that are located in the IBM building. Right now, that restaurant is, is uh, struggling. Uh, they're looking forward to the additional 79 jobs that, that are being placed here by CFI. Uh, there are other restaurants and other retailers in the district that are going to uh, uh, be supportive of this deal because of the additional jobs. Uh, the last thing that I'd like to, add to, to mention this evening is if you look at the unemployment rate of Las Vegas and that, uh, you'll see that they're near the bottom. And you can be sure that they're going to do whatever they can to attract these jobs there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kevin. 
um, a, a unique opportunity where not only the, the city can partner with the state, but the county's even here telling, telling us how great it is. Um, and is it fair to say that if, if, if we kind of set this trend now, uh, more tax abatements that come to the city won't be as burdensome moving forward because we have this existing partnership that we've supported or perhaps will support with the MEDC? The City of Southfield, Oakland County, and the MEDC have been working in a coordinated effort for many years. Again, the state has restructured their incentive program, so accessing the, the MEDC dollars is a very limited pot of money. And so when we're able to do that, the state is asking for some sort of local match from the community. And we would ask the county to help support that initiative. We have, because we do have a lot of um, vacancies in our office buildings, we have been aggressive and going after companies. The city is a poor community, which enables us to utilize the Public Act 328, which is offering personal property tax abatement when we see it fit. And so if we do have an opportunity that there's a large, to entice a large um, company to either come to the city of Southfield or to expand in our community, it is one of the options that we can offer to that company. Again, there are restrictions on the type of projects that we can offer incentives to, but you know we are in a very competitive nature, like it's been stated, and so anything that we can do to give us the upper hand over our neighboring community, we feel it's important with that offer out. I, I, I think this is great that you know this project meets at that intersection where not only the state and the county are on board, but the city can play a role in, in supporting a business that is bringing 79, at least 79 jobs. That's the, that's the minimum commitment, um, especially in, in a building that uh, could use a, a boost of life. That is, it's a, it's a pretty hallmark building of the city of Southfield. Uh, so I, I'm going to vote in the affirmative. Um, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm voting that. All right, we have a motion by Mr. Brady, supported by Ms. Jordan. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion has carried with one exception. I'm sorry, with one uh, name. Uh, that's to establish the Industrial Development District under Public Hearing B. Now we come to Public Hearing C, which is an uh, Shelley, do you want to take up? Yes. So again, um, Computer Facilities Integration is requesting um, a personal property exemption under Public Act 328. Uh, again, they are making a $545,000 investment in the city, and we um, and we'll be hiring 79 new um, jobs at that location. And again, we'll be asking for a three-year abatement for a total of 12,000. $244. And Ms. Shelley Freeman, I would like to show you what I was reading from. I was reading um, about the establishment of my industrial district. Thank you very much. Order. My name is Pamela Gerald, P.O. Box 165, Southfield, Michigan. 48037-0155. My telephone number is 248-3529-188. And since I have time for this public hearing, what I was reading to Shelley was the light industrial district, what it's used for, and the intent. Southfield, Michigan Code of Ordinances, Chapter 25, Article 19, Section 5.175 and 5.176. Check it out. I just, again, want to say that I think the city of Southfield is, or the employees on behalf of the city of Southfield, they're basically using these tax abatements as a marketing tool. Now, when you call into the city and you're put on hold, it tells you a lot of things that is good about this city. So let me tell you on some of the good things about the city. Number one, Southfield is the home of the oldest regional mall in the United States and the state of Michigan, built in 1954. That's Northland Mall, which I don't think the downtown development is doing enough to market that mall. It has 1.2 million square feet of retail space. Benefit number two, many businesses are familiar with the fact that Southfield is the center of it all, and it's true, but I'm not sure if you know.
note that the city of Southdale has 27 square feet of office space and over 7 million commercial industrial space. Point of order, Ms. Gerald, you are to speak to this particular issue of the tax abatement. I am. No, you're not. You're talking I am. about other projects in the city that have nothing I'm talking to do about with that. the tax abatement. You are not. You're talking about other things. Well, I don't know that it's an appropriate point of order for you to tell me how is. to arrive it's at my point. You're I'm not, not going to be argumentative with you. You want to bait me. You can you be angry with that. somebody no, else. Don't be angry. You're not with talking me. about this issue. point of order to the city attorney. Does it say in Robert's Rules of Order that you tell me how to arrive at my point? You have to stick to the Does it say me? how to arrive at my point? Point of order. Not city address, attorney. Do not address the staff. Ms. Gerald, city attorney, does it say that I have to arrive at my point about tax abatement the way that the council president sees fit for me to do so? Ms. I'd like a point of order respectfully, please. Ms. Gerald, you are being disruptive of this meeting, and she is not required to answer you. She does not work for you. You are not. Oh, she does work for me. No, she does not. Oh, she does. No, she she works for all the taxpayers in this city. Not just like you do. Call. Just it's like not. you do. The citizens are at the top of the organization. Well, chart. Not. And no, Madam Chair, you are not talking about the public here at hand. And this is about a PA 328 for computerized facility integration. You are not staying on the subject at hand. You're not staying on the subject. Neither are you. And you should sit down. Neither are you. Stick to the subject. Neither are you. Stick to the subject. Neither are you. You're the person that's coming up here to speak. I'm going to arrive at my point. Everything else I'm going to arrive at my point. Make it quick. Make it quick. You wasted my time, so no, I'm going to proceed. Minutes, and thank you so. kindly for your um, five, approval. Five minutes, uh, you have, uh, we have a daytime population of 175,000 people down. in this city and 71,000 residents. We are the first city in the state of Michigan to host the Peace Walk in commemorative of Martin Luther King's birthday to the Martin Luther King Task Force. And we also have won numerous awards. I'm not in support of this tax abatement. I do not feel that it should be granted. And it's an uh, insult to the residents of the city. Thank you. Thank you.
new, new customers for things as Fred Zorn might say we're dry cleaning business. There's no way to verify that these people come from other cities to work at a location and bring their dry cleaning, go grocery shopping, buy gas. All these have been used to verify that these policies are still noteworthy and should be offered from, due to the fact that all we get back. Look at the hundred acres of residential property Lear purchased and went bankrupt and they still collect a yearly fee to own that hundred acres. And you'll understand some of our frustration with a policy that does nothing but augment the millions and billions these companies walk with every year and pay less, pay less than their fair share. It's, it's so common sense of, a, of an idea for democracy to be funded fairly and equally I still can't believe 20 years almost since I appeared first before you and asked that this policy been reconsidered. Nothing's been done but highlighted and multiply its use as the recent as the current administration has shown new records set for tax abatement approval in a month, at a meeting, in a year, in a, in a three year tenure. All those records are out of the water now that the current administration has set standards that are so high to offer these tax abatements to people who aren't on our side, or on the side of the dotted line, which as we know at the end of the year comes up positive for them while we're left to wonder. Thank you. My name is Barbara Talley, and I reside at 15801 Providence Drive in Southfield. Can you even tell from her? I just want to give you some background. I don't think that any of you were here when I was on the city council, and I didn't even meet Mr. Lance. Um, he came on in 1983, he came on in 1985, and during that time, we did approve some tax abatements, and Lear was one of them. And we did approve a number of tax abatements. And I feel that those tax abatements were good for the city. I don't know what happened afterwards, because I wasn't on the city council, but we did have a clause that we would look at those tax abatements and their credibility after a year, particularly about their employment and what they have done and what they uh, brought back to the city. And I don't know if that's done or not, but I certainly approve this protect, particular tax statement because I think it's <coughs> something like the stimulus plan uh, where we, the federal government, and many people don't even think that that was good, the, the stimulus plan and look what has happened there. But in this economic um, society that we have right now, I think this is best for the city and I think that it should be approved. Thank you, Ms. Howard. Anyone else? Madam Judge, for the record, Mr. Mullen, and the time we've been for this week. Madam President, my name is Gerard Mullen. Since 1968, I have lived at 1788 Louis Street, and since 1961, I have worked in the city of Southfield. I have some good news and I have some bad news. The good news I approve, the bad news, Council's legal notice for this public hearing is improper. Council's notice incorrectly cites the wrong time, that is, Eastern Standard Time. The state of Michigan, by statute law, is on a different time standard. To be very precise, Council's notice violates PA 110, Article 1, Section 103, Subsection 4C. Check it out. Check it out. Thank you, Madam President.
much that tax abatement is going to affect the residents of the city. And with this particular one, we're looking at approximately $12,000, $12,244. And Shelly has helped me out. This will be being paid back in four years according to the schedule. So we'll be getting our money back. And that comes out to $0.15 per resident per year. So the dollar amount that is equated to what we're abating, and when you compare that to the jobs that will be created, when you compare it to the potential increase with the sales and revenue and income from those employees that will be coming into the city, even with the possibility of just 1% of the 79 potential employees deciding to live here, it's a wash. It's actually a gain for the city of South Shore. And in this particular case, I fully support this application, and I think it's best for the city of South Shore. We cannot afford to lose any revenue, but in this case, the revenue will be returned to us. Jobs will be created, and there is a possibility, which really excites me, of some sort of partnership where we can present our housing stock to the employees. I'm not saying they're all going to live here. That would be a dream, but it would be just a great proposal that we would like to present to the employees of the city. So I fully support what we're moving forward with. Ms. Joanne? Thank you. Thank you. Every single dollar that we don't get in taxes don't benefit the people. It hurts the people. If there's no benefit to the people, there's no benefit to the city. The benefit is the companies themselves, and the thing is that they give us 79 employees, 150, 20. That is baloney. You will see. If it's true, it will be the first truth the tax abatement recipient has said to us. It never happened before. It never happens. I'm going to watch and see if they do hire 79 people. But it doesn't matter. The taxes for three years or four years taken away from the people of Virginia. That's my philosophy, and that's my advice that I got from experts in all the finance, some of the financial companies in Southfield. Go on believing what you want to believe, but I'll believe what I believe, and I think I'm telling the truth. Ms. Camino? One last comment, and show me something else again. The new governor, or the current governor, is asking that the employers notify the state when the employees are hired. Is that correct? Okay. We will be meeting the state of Michigan, their representative, as well as the representative from Oakland County and myself. We'll meet with the company on a regular basis. But in order for them to receive their funding from the MEDC, they will have to verify that these people have been hired. It is a requirement. Can you notify the council when there are new hirings so that we can do our due diligence in terms of people that are hired or brought in? Very good idea, Shelley. You can notify us, I'll believe it. Well, I do meet with the companies on a yearly basis, and their commitment is to hire a certain number of people each year. I'd be happy, and I have in the past submitted reports to verify what the companies have been doing, and I'd be happy to continue to do that. And I'm not just talking about this company. I'm talking about all of the other companies. Right. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
portion of the community with a major investment and a major commitment from the city to make it a, um, a community that had a large business component. And we are the business center of Southeast Michigan. We have more office space than many communities, at least a half a dozen of them, in several states all put together. Um, I'm in favor of this because it's a high-tech company. It's going to bring, uh, it's, it's the kind of company we really want to have here, we want to stay, we want to grow. This is a partnership. Nobody's losing anything. We will get, continue to get what we were getting before. And, and this is personal property. This means their equipment. So after that period of time, their taxes will be even higher than they are now, but they will continue to pay the taxes that they're paying. This is a, to me, it's a no-brainer. This is a good thing. I totally support it. I'm proud to have you here, and I'm certainly going to be in favor. So, council, if there's nothing further, um, I'm going to ask uh, to vote. All in favor? Aye. All right. The most, um, we have six days and one day. Good evening, through the chair. <coughs> this next public hearing is held to consider the proposed amendment to the Southfield Comprehensive Master Plan, MP02, to include a non-motorized pathway and public transit supplement draft dated February 17, 2012, as amended, in accordance with Chapter 45 Zoning of Title V Zoning and Planning Code, City of Southfield. Uh, as follows, amend the Southfield Comprehensive Master Plan to include a non-motorized pathway and public transit plan supplement, draft dated February 17, 2012, as amended. This amendment specifically provides for a non-motorized pathway and public transit plan supplement as amended to be part of the comprehensive plan. The planning department is in support of the proposed amendment to the Southfield Comprehensive Master Plan and recommends adoption of the attached draft amendment for the following reasons. One, the amendment is prepared by the City of Southfield Planning Department, the City of Southfield Planning Commission, and residents with the assistance of the Greenway Collaborative Consulting Group has been thoroughly studied by the Planning Commission at their Planning Commission study meetings and regular meetings. The non-motorized pathway and public transit supplement will serve to guide and coordinate decisions in developing an efficient transportation system that meets the needs of various users, including drivers, pedestrians, bicyclists, and public transit riders, to encourage an active and healthy lifestyle, to reduce fossil fuel consumption, to provide a more pedestrian-friendly and accessible environment, to improve safety for pedestrians, to link destinations through non-motorized pathways, to foster economic development, to increase the use of public transit facilities, and to increase the quality of life for our residents, our businesses, and visitors of Southfield. Also, to leverage state and federal funding sources when available, to offer mobility options for seniors, persons with disability, and low-income families, and to create a sense of community by encouraging pedestrian interaction. The non-motorized pathway and public transit plan is a guide. Further additional public hearings will be held before any of the items are implemented. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions after the public hearings can help. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. 
We do not need naysayers. You know me, I don't give up easily. I encourage you to adopt this plan for a pedestrian friendly community. When you do, you will be known as the can do city council. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew.
Before you folks start building a moonwalk over the expressway, I think you should first replace 4,125 square feet of walkway you removed last summer. Parallel to the service drive is an unfinished five feet wide city sidewalk that you folks began in 1977. There is only 488 more feet to be added to this abandoned project so that this sidewalk will finally abut the Glove Street. I suggest you folks finish these overdue projects in Southfield before you start building a, pro a project in Mecca. On the north side of McGlunk Street, there used to be a sidewalk on South Road, but in 2003, the city removed it to install a storm sewer, and the city never replaced the removed sidewalk. I called the proper person in the city who was in charge of this project, and I've been waiting close to nine years now for a return phone call. I suggest you folks replace this sidewalk first before you start building moonwalks over expressways. Let's walk up to Mount Vernon, a.k.a. Nine and a Half Mile, to the Love and Care Animal Hospital on the northeast corner. The hospital was remodeled in 2010, and the city required the new owner to upgrade the property by installing handicap parking and a screening fence for the dumpster. But the city didn't require the hospital to install sidewalks on Southfield Road nor on Mount Vernon. This is the only site in the immediate area that doesn't have city sidewalk. Is this a city of progress or a status quo? The Southfield Area Chamber of Commerce happens to be located directly behind this hospital in the Century Plaza building. I think the city needs to install a pair of sidewalks on the corner of this major interchange before it starts dreaming about a walking utopia. Let's walk up a quarter mile to Silver Maple, which abuts the big white elephant that you folks bought in 1996. Council has plenty of money to buy a white elephant on Southfield Road, but no money for sidewalks on Southfield Road. Case in point, the city block on Southfield Road next to the white elephant between Silver Maple and Stratford has no sidewalk, just a dirt path. Now let's take a quantum leap to Lincoln Drive, aka Ten and a Half Mile Road. At Ten and a Half Mile Road, a miracle occurs, the miracle on South Hill Road. Hold on to your hats, folks. This may be hard to believe, but it's true. Between Ten and a Half Mile Road and Twelve Mile Road, and on both sides of South Hill Road, for a total of three solid miles, there is contiguous pavement to walk on and to bike on, right at the heart of the city of South Hill, in the center of the center of it all. A walking mecca the Miracle on South Hill Road, a.k.a. Lake of Village. And of course, when you cross 12 Mile Road and re-enter the city of Sidewalk Hill, it's hodgepodge all over again. Lake of has a standard when it comes to sidewalks. Sad to say, South Hill has no standard, period. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you.
in the morning, at 6 o'clock in the morning, with some people walking late at night, and we did not have sidewalks before because all of the apartments abutted the um, curb. Those were with state dollars, and we certainly appreciate that. Thank you,
Um, we did do the nine mile corridor study and there, it did involve houses, it did involve um, sidewalks, it did involve a lot of things, but it didn't meet with the uh, ultimate approval of the people because there were uh, involved a lot of sales of houses and rezoning and so forth. But what my question is, could you explain for the extent of the viewing audience and those who are here how sidewalks are funded? Yes, uh, to the chair. Um, sidewalks basically uh, are funded by special assessment. Uh, they don't, that isn't the only method, but that is generally the method in, in the neighborhoods. The charge is to the neighborhood, and, and if, the neighborhood, if the neighborhood wants a sidewalk, is there a requirement that so many people would have to want them before they can be um, or is it, uh, I mean, if there's an assessment, there has to be some request from the community. We don't just go in and yes. tell them when to do this. 60%. Some of the residents have to sign a petition that they want us to allow us to uh, have assess the cost of the sidewalk to the neighborhood. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you. I hope that answers the question on the sidewalk. Um, Anyone else wishes to speak on this issue? If not, I'll close the public hearing. I, I appreciate the dialogue, and I want to say that um, a city that doesn't plan um, will not be able to meet the demands of its community. And what we have before us, the opportunity, Mr. Mullen talked about some of the missed opportunities we've had in the city. And I do think it is um, unacceptable that in our city we don't have clear walking connected walking paths. Um, we have some wonderful parks and we've done a great job of providing opportunities for individuals to go to parks and walk. But as we know, individuals like to walk in their community, um, children playing in the community and other things. I know I have walked in different parts of the city and abruptly the sidewalk was disappeared. Um, as Mr. Mullen said, and that is not, um, it's not having the um, strategy to promote health and fitness in our city, and just absolutely for safety of pedestrians. I, um, I applaud this effort, and I think it's much needed. But the public needs to know this is a plan. This is a plan. And any part of this plan, before it can be implemented, must be brought to the council. And the council will, based on the, the funding requirements, resources that we have, will make a decision whether to implement it or not. In addition to it being a plan, it has the ability to, um, the council has the ability to change that plan, to adopt it or tweak it as is needed. But what it does, it sets us in the right direction. And, and Mr. Mullen, I, I keep referring to you, um, I, it's not acceptable acceptable to me for our residents to feel that we don't have a, um, we're, we're sidewalk, um, not friendly, I guess, or use it more, but we should have a plan and we should be working toward that, and I do hope that this is not a plan that's put on the, on the shelf. I do want to talk about um, the concept of our master plan being obsolete. This is one of the ways you you, you address it being obsolete by updating it and amending it and adding to it to keep it alive. Because if you do adopt a plan and sit it on the shelf, time changes, ordinance changes, needs change, and if it doesn't become a living, breathing document that you address and tweak as, as we uh, as we grow and change as a city, it does become obsolete. So I think this is um, this is in the right direction to bring life into our master plan. We must have a plan because if not, we'll just keep sitting here talking about it and uh, we won't have the opportunity to move forward. It allows the council, uh, we had an um, in depth meeting, and I was glad the council, myself, and, and, and the city administrator to, to get an, um, an education on what a comprehensive uh, sidewalk or bike path plan would look like for our city. And that's that's what we're going to have to do more and more of because unfortunately a lot of the things that we're planning we're not able to implement in time but we can't become stagnant and do nothing. We must have it planned and as, as the economy changes and opportunities present itself, we'll be 
ready to go. And, and the, the most important thing about it, it educates us as a city. Um, we, everyone raves about our parks, but you know, I have got I have got emails about people complaining about our disconnected walkways. And when I did run into um, Miss Shuni Rose, she had her backpack on, she was gladly walking, and I said, "How did you get here?" Because I knew it was no clear walkway from her home to that McDonald's. She said, "Boy, it was rough, but you know, I made it." And, and it was very concerning to me because I knew that there was not a a safe pedestrian path. So I would I would like for the city to um, adopt this plan and uh, empower the council. And that's, this is what it is: it's empowering the council to um, create um, a strategy or a plan that they have complete control over because this plan belongs to the council for their direction setting policy but they're adopting the plan which says the statement of the city that we're going to move forward and that we are going to move from, from the label that Mr. Mullen gave us tonight to a city that will embrace and will promote healthy walking, safe pedestrian paths and, and um, bike paths throughout the city. Thank you. Just for the sake of the audience, I want to explain a couple of things that have come up in this discussion. The master plan is a guide. It is a guide. It is not cast in concrete. It's not something that we have to, that we're mandated to do. It's a guide. And it's required by state law. The current uh, non-motorized pedestrian um, I'm sorry, non-motorized pathway and public transit plan is also a guide. It's a concept. The concepts in it are appropriate and they're multifaceted. We're required to have a plan of this nature for the energy uh, grants that we're seeking. They require that we have this type of a plan to save fossil fuels, to all the things that would require us to reduce our carbon footprint, so to speak, I'm saying that in very large, broad terms. We are not required at this point to pass this, but we are required to have it. And again, it's a guide, it is not cast in stone. There are areas on the west side of the city, and there are areas within the city that don't, neighborhoods that do not want sidewalks. So it's not a question that the city can go ahead and do this because the city itself is not going to pay for all of these things. Certainly not sidewalks that's by special assessment. And I want a lot of, there's a lot of kind of misunderstanding in the part of some people and some people I'm sure that are listening as to what this will do and how it will be funded. Um, Mr. Crowe, if you want to add anything. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, again, I want to reiterate this is similar to a road map when you're planning on a trip. You're not forced to follow that exact route. There's detours along the way. You might stop if you see something um, and change course. As you stated, it is a guide. It's an important uh, requirement for the funding that the city received for the uh, energy efficiency block grant dollars. However, by having the plan in place and adopted by the city, it does open up additional dollars, both federal and state funds. The state of Michigan, has adopted complete streets re um, legislation, which requires that when you're doing a road, as Mr. Mullen had indicated, that we just don't focus on resurfacing for automobile only. And that if there are gaps in the sidewalk system or the pathway system, that those also have to be addressed. There are many sidewalk gaps um, um, that are unfortunate. In some places we found uh, evidence of what we call goat paths, where people are walking, but there is no, no pavement pavement there. Uh, examples of existing projects or current projects that are happening. Beach Road is, is due for resurfacing and, and rebuilding and because the uh, pathway plan has been indicated on, in our master plan, the um, federal state um, has to address the bridge to accommodate pedestrians. So that, that, that just by having the plan in place. Catalpa Park, Oakland County is making improvements they have a groundbreaking scheduled for um, April the 6th, and as part of their um, playground improvements, they are going to inst institute uh, part of this bike pathway plan from Greenfield Road to their entrance. Again, because the master plan had indicated the, the pathway, 
they are obligated to fulfill that in the county agency. We also have private development on a case-by-case -case basis as development comes into the city and redevelopment where uh, there are no sidewalks, we require sidewalks where we indicate an eight or 10 foot wide path, bike path, instead of the five foot sidewalk, the developer would uh, install the eight to 10 foot bike path. And as the chair had indicated, where communities and neighborhoods want um, sidewalks or pathways put in, they have the option of requesting a special assessment district to, to help fund over time the um, installation of the, the pathway plan. There are many recommendations in Chapter 7 that don't cost any money at all. It's just about good policy. It's about stretching limited dollars. It talks about uh, strategies, cooperating with departments, um, developing task force, working with private developers, evaluating, identifying, determining, um, providing, creating. Those are all terms that don't cost the city specific dollars, but they do help towards um, providing a sense of community, quality of life, addressing health issues, and economic development. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any of the questions that the council may have. And again, our recommendation is to adopt the non-motorized pathway and public transit plan as a guide. Madam President, I would move the adoption of the non-motorized pathway plan. Support. A motion by Mr. Simon, supported by Mr. Frazier. During the President's meeting, Terry, I asked a question on this subject. What is the timeline and how long will it take? And you said 20 years. That's correct. Oh. Yeah, town meeting. So if it will take 20 years, nothing is going to be immediate. Uh, when it comes to sidewalks, usually it's the sidewalk is assessed to the homeowner, to the company, or whatever. But they pay for it. Through, through the chair, Mr. Lance, yeah. the Downtown Development Authority for the last one or two seasons has been implementing sidewalks as part of their, their district. They've been installing sidewalks and making improvements in... Who has a cornerstone? That, that, yes, that's correct. Yeah, the cornerstone is taking the assessments and people's tax money to do it. That, that's, that's one way of implementing uh, the system. Well, that's another way of a tax abatement. And the cornerstone is getting the tax abatement from us. Our own agency, which I call an autonomous city in a city, is using our tax money or the tax money that they collect in that area to do anything they want to do. Oh, we heard the problems chair. there too. But that's besides the point now. I, I believe it's a tax increase. We have a city within a city run by the appointed people, which I object to. The people that elect them. That's besides the point at this moment. But nothing will be done. I'm not against sidewalks. I'm not against most of this stuff. But when is it going to be done? Well, again, Mr. Lance, I've, I've indicated a couple examples where uh, this year, Catalpa Park, the Oakland County will be installing a pathway from and Greenfield the to the entrance. Oakland County will do it. Right. right. Good. Very good. Civic Center, Civic Center Drive is being rebuilt as part of a state-funded project, and part of that will be in filling um, sidewalks where they're missing. That's all well and good. The city, so center, is, the city center is spending some dollars on improving pedestrian amenities. That's the Lawrence tax. Tax. That's the money. Okay, that's Lawrence, I, I'm just giving you examples of how some of this will start this year, but it might take up to 20 okay, years. Okay, I, I want that information. I want that information in the record also that who is going to pay for certain projects. And I have no objection to that. I have objection to the to force the people, the mandate the people to pay for it. And, and that's not proposed, and as I've indicated, should there be a desire by certain neighborhoods to install sidewalks or pathways, we would hold additional meetings, and if they so choose, if federal state funding isn't available, they have the option of requesting a special assessment district. 
In no case of that suggesting tax dollars. Is that fair to assess a tax upon the people? If more than 60% are in favor of it, that's how it works. We've done that before. I don't know if more than 60% are in favor. Through the chair. There's a series of public hearings where we have to give notice. And the public, all those affected tax owners, get notified. I'd like that to be spelled out. It's spelled out in our special assessment district rules. And you proceed to say that. And I'm using that as an example. I didn't see it. Do we have that? We have that in writing. Yes, we do. Okay, thanks. I just want to talk a little bit about the plan and why I'm going to be supporting it passionately. Councilman Frazier and Syver and I just returned last week from the National League of Cities Conference. We learned that other communities are taking plans and visions just like this and bringing them to their cities and finding themselves in hot demand for new development and ways to not only retain their residents but build upon their population. I'll touch on some of the things that we learned at the sessions at the conference. But the night before I left for the conference, I'm a late packer. I'm a last-minute packer. So I was late at night and I needed a few things. And I was right around the corner from Walgreens. And I was thinking, you know, it's open late. I've got to make a quick trip. And I'm probably going to walk farther distance from this council chamber to my car, leaving the meeting to go home, than I live from that Walgreens. But I had to drive to Walgreens, you know, to get those last-minute items. Because the sidewalk from where I live to the Walgreens, it goes for a little bit. It stops. There's a ditch. There's several trees that are in the way. And it continues a ways down the road. So at that time at night, the only option would have been to walk on the road, which I wasn't going to do late at night. And that's not atypical in Southfield. I think we all experience something like that at some part of the city or the other. That's not smart development. That's not smart development for 2012. And quite frankly, Southfield has incomplete and insufficient non-motorized pathways all throughout the city. And part of the reason why I was elected to this body wasn't just to be a new voice, but also to be a voice for a new generation. And young people seek out a community based on how easy it is to get around. I have friends that they've moved all over, really all over the country, and they didn't take cars with them. They live in cities where they work, and they're happy to keep their life confined to that small, walkable bubble in their city. And that's a trend that goes beyond just my friends and colleagues. The conference that we went to made a point of saying that two-thirds, two-thirds of young professionals seek out a community first and then seek employment within that community. And walkability and mobility, it's a large part of that, where you want to live. In Southfield, we're a huge business address in the state. We're proud of that. We're uniquely poised to take advantage of this floating potential, this floating young town who might be able to find a job in Southfield but wouldn't want to live here. This plan also, and it's important to note, this plan is not just for young people. Improving our walkways throughout the city benefits our seniors as well. And I told the story when we first came on before the committee of the whole meeting about my great uncle who lived in Lancaster Hills apartment. And he was in his mid to late 80s at the time and fiercely, fiercely independent. And Lancaster is right across the street from Meijer, and he walked. He walked, and my family got really nervous whenever he was going about. He walked to Tell 12. He walked to the shopping centers around the area. You have a not friendly pedestrian walkway that spans across six or seven, at some point, lanes of traffic. And he wasn't incapable of walking and didn't want to be kept inside of his home, but it was just not a safe situation. Because our streets and our sidewalks and our crosswalks were designed decades ago when we had this big baby population that was younger. Now that that population is growing older in age, should the infrastructure around us match that community's needs? So this plan, it takes all of that into consideration, and it meets at a place that satisfies the needs of my generation and the economic development potential that we bring. And it satisfies an aging but increasingly mobile generation. So I'll get back down to earth, because I know I'm overselling this plan. It's not going to solve our economic crisis. It's not going to turn Southfield into a walking utopia or mecca overnight, as was mentioned.
mention. But what does it say of us as a city council if we can't pass a non-binding plan that directly spends nothing so far? There's not one dollar allocated in here for anything yet. Um, we reserve the right as a body to approve or disapprove any spending projects. We'll have public hearings with public input on everything. What does it say of us if we can't pay for the sidewalks and bike trails, improved signage, healthy living? What does it say of our vision for Southfield? Literally, step one in this plan is evaluate bicycle and pedestrian focused corridors to determine what type of improvements are feasible in the near, mid, and long term. We can support that. Uh, we, we need all the tools in our toolbox that we face unprecedented economic challenges. Uh, approving this gives us another tool. It gives us a, another option uh, to present when we're seeking funding from state and federal resources, seeking out private public partnerships. And it, this plan with city council's approval will be pretty strong. It says it has the, the seal of Southfield on it. We're approving of it. We want to move forward with it when we're looking for funding options. This plan is important, so I support it. Yeah, so there are a number of people who came and were very critical of the fact that we have sidewalks that, that disappear. They, they, they are for a while and they stop. But I think we really need to be fair to the previous councils, even going all the way back to the beginning. This was not, this city was not designed for people to walk. It was, back in those days, it was easy to get your car and drive. And in fact, it was almost like a status center. You didn't, you didn't have a house, you could get in a car and drive. But over the years, as there were some neighborhoods where the, the parents wanted their children to be able to ride bicycles up and down the up and down their sidewalk. So when work was being done on the street, they asked to have sidewalks put in. But people in the next block or 100, 100 yards away didn't want it. They wanted more of a country atmosphere with no sidewalks. So the city council followed their wishes and didn't put sidewalks in. So that ended up looking like a hot spot. But in, in reality, the councils back then were really trying to communicate and work with the residents and meet their needs. We've evolved to a point where people feel it's more important to walk, ride bicycles, because gas is four dollars a gallon. If gas was a dollar and twenty-five cents a gallon, we probably wouldn't even be talking about sidewalks. Um, but the fact that ga gas is four dollars a gallon, we all, all of a sudden got religion about walking, and, uh, and that's not a problem. But we shouldn't fault the folks that got us to where we are because. They made the best decisions that they knew how to make. And what we're here to do is make the best decisions we know how to make for now and the future. There's nothing to say that at some future time there would be seven council members sitting up here saying, why did they do this back in 2012? Why didn't they put moving sidewalks in? Because, you know, it's, <laughs> as, as the world evolves, New ideas come up. Uh, new solutions are are found. I am supporting this because it's a plan, and it's it helps us to decide what we're going to do in the future. And there's an old axiom that says, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And we don't have a plan on the books. When something comes up that we could take advantage of it, it won't be there. So. It's a way to go. Thank you.
next steps for this plan? Well, it's to, uh, none of it has anything to do with spending money, um, and we're in no position to spend money, but um, we are uh, uh, wise to have a plan or a vision. So the next steps are evaluate bicycle and pedestrian focus corridors to determine what type of improvements are feasible in the near, mid, and long term future. Uh, Secondly, evaluate proposed trails for feasibility and environmental impact. Third, field check neighborhood connector routes. Dalton Road would be a great one. Um, identify ways to improve existing freeway crossings. Uh, uh, fifth one, determine most appropriate type of crossing improvements on primary roads, taking into account the requirements of the Orthodox Jewish community. Uh, next, evaluate and make recommendations for policy programs regarding maintenance, ADA compliance, school transportation, complete streets, safe routes to school, bike safety, pedestrian and bicycle advisory committee, transit oriented uh, development, so on. I, and I could go on. Um, none of that costs any money. It's about um, gathering data and moving forward. Um, those are our, our, our next steps. If in the plan, there, there's one part of the plan that uh, in the, uh, it's not really part of the plan, it's the background information. On, in the second section, pages uh, uh, 2, 12, uh, 2, uh, 13, um, we have a map of Southfield, you can't see this, but we have a map of Southfield. It shows where in, in the last, uh, from 2004 to 2010, there have been over 75 bicycle car accidents. We are not um, fr uh, uh, friendly to our uh, bicycles. Even worse, on the next page, uh, page 213, there, there were well over, uh, I can't even count them, the number of red dots um, of uh, pedestrian car crashes. Uh, from time to time, we uh, get advised by the police department of fatality um, where uh, someone has been crossing the street and has been um, has lost their life. Um, this has to be a concern of this council um, that we need to, uh, uh, the safety of our, our residents and our visitors is, is paramount. Um, honestly, I wish we had the money to do this tomorrow. We don't, so we're going to have to take it step, um, step by step. Um, and finally, uh, I wanted to note that um, on Friday, uh, Council received the um, journal, uh, the March April journal from the uh, Michigan Municipal League uh, called the Review. And in there, there's a whole thing on um, um, walkability. And I just want to read it and indulge me in one uh, further minute. Um, number one trail state in America is Michigan. According to the Trails and Greenway Alliance, popularity for trails has skyrocketed as people embrace trails for fitness, reconnecting with nature, commuting for pure Michigan fun. Did you know that 2,478 miles of non-motorized trails uh, in Michigan, we leave the country as the number one trail state in America, and we're not connected to this. Um, but obviously, a lot of other people in Michigan think that this is important. They put a value on it to the point that we've become uh, the number one trail state in, uh, in the nation. Uh, it's nice to see Michigan at the top of some list. Um, <laughs> so, um, I, of course, I'm going to support this plan and this decision. Uh, <coughs> We didn't pay for the study as uh, part of our grant, and um, there is nothing immediate that we're going to do other than study. Um, so I, I, I hope that uh, we adopt this tonight, and I, I guess the final thing I would say, when we do have funding opportunities, it should say, this has been approved by the council. It shouldn't say, well, we had a report to study them. It should say that the council endorsed it to um, promote securing funds uh, when they, they uh, come our way. Thank you, Mr. Sidewalk, Mr. Yeah. I am not against sidewalks. I am against the total plan.
plan of voting for a plan. I would think that you would itemize, I'd like to see the, you itemize every project, every plan. Then we know what you're going to do. And then we know what we're going to do. Uh, is that a good idea? Well, through the, again, through the chair, again, the, the, the next steps are to identify future projects. So yes, we don't have any your projects that you we've want, identified. You want a vote to be set in stone? No. Without the comments, that's what I'm saying. We're, we're asking this to be a guide, but by adopting the guide, it allows right. us to um, hopefully secure additional federal and state dollars. Okay, but you, you want us to mention that you're adopting it to put into the master plan. I would suggest a plan, not to put it into the master plan, but to be a part of the master plan. That's what we're asking. Okay. With all due respect, this is a supplement to the master plan. That should be spelled out. It, and so not that call it the master plan. It's a supplement to the master plan. Okay. That's what the resolution states. I think we're on the same page, Mr. Lambs. Well, I'm not against sidewalks the way everybody is giving the impression that we're all against. Well, therefore, we are against. Not so. Not so. Those sidewalks could have been fixed. The one on 12 mile, mile near their uh, uh, Walgreens could have been fixed years and years and years ago. Okay? They should be fixed. Okay, and it will be fixed. But, not to vote for a plan that will be set in stone, I don't want that. I'm not asking If you for say a supplement, that's, that's what we're asking for, sir. And to, and to do the work every time you get a grant or something, that's fine too. But I don't want extra tens of thousands to be put in, like we did in building a sewer west of Telegraph. Cost us seven million dollars, and that's our loss. The people are paying double for water because of that. Through the chair. I don't want, I don't want a thing like that anymore. Uh, we're not asking for any dollars at this time. I know you're not, but I, I'm, I'm not taking the chance that we're voting the blanket plan for you. I want the plan itemized of what we're going to get. And that's what we're going to work on. That's correct. To be eligible for federal and state funding, they want to see that the city has adopted a, um, a plan. And this is a specific requirement for the energy efficiency black grant dollars, which uh, total over half a million dollars that the city received previously.
where we want them to go because we can keep paying. There's no dollars attached. There are dollars attached. Your time and your salary is attached to if you're out working on something else. So I, I, I want to be very, very clear on what what we're doing tonight. We're going to adopt this plan so that we can keep the federal dollars so that we can be compliant with uh, what's necessary. Or if we're going to adopt this plan and now give a new charge to our uh, city planner to start planning the streets. And I firmly believe that this city is facing more pressing issues, even though we need to do it, even though the next gen the younger generation it's important to them. But I think there's some other things that we need to give direction to the planner. So that's kind of where I am. Thank you, Ms. Jordan, and I'd be happy to come back to the council. A year ago, we had what we called a visioning workshop where we talked about different things that you would like us to work on. This was kind of part and parcel to that, and I'd be happy to come back to the new council and have a work session so that we get some direction on what, you, what your priorities are. And this will be part and parcel to all of that, but not exclusive.
previous plan and economic development, he had business retention, and he had planning. And so I sometimes I think the message is across in there because there have been times I've called him and he's clearly informed me that that's not his area of responsibility. That, you know, I'm, I'm planning we do have a business retention department and others can do that. So I think it's important that the council do visit the priorities and have all the parts because the clear direction of council when he was hired was that he was to stay in plan <coughs> and not expand as the previous planner was allowed to expand do. He had it all. This planner does not. And so the priorities mean you need to understand that it encompasses more than Terry Crow is the economic development. And I agree with you. We need to have a clear the council needs to have a clear expectation and set the priorities because those are your priorities. And so I, I think that was a very timely meeting there. All right, I want to weigh in here. Um, first of all, I heard somebody say, Terry, Mr. Crow, I heard someone say that this study was paid for with a grant. I thought we had, it was under $10,000. It was. was. So it wasn't a grant. It was, the, the funding came from the Energy Efficiency Block Grant funds. The um, consultant that we hired, Greenway Collaborative's fees were under $10,000. Okay, so the how, much, of how much did the study cost us then, even though we used to have a grant, how much did, it, did the study cost? Um, in addition to the consultancy. Well, just just the the, the time of in house that uh, that we we charge towards it and our internship. Then what? I don't get where the grant came in. The grant came in to pay for um, the hiring of the consultant to assist us. So, but I thought that ten thousand dollars was internal. The, the ten thousand dollars under ten thousand dollars was to hire a consultant, and then there was funds that the city received for administrative fees that were in addition to the ten thousand. But you said for the consultant. The consultant fees were under ten thousand dollars. Right. I believe there was twenty five thousand dollars allocated out of the entire grant. Okay. Of which less than ten thousand were spent for the consultant. The rest of the fees were absorbed by the city for administrative costs for the implementation and that was of the under ten thousand dollars that was absorbed. Because it was said in the meeting when you first presented it, somebody asked the question, and it, 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 you said it was under ten thousand dollars. It was under ten thousand dollars. Right. So I asked, my, my understanding was that administration gave approval to spend that money. Mine, correct? That's, no, you're correct. But I'm, I'm missing something here about where the, the, the grant came in. The total grant, I believe, and if Mr. Zorn is here, I believe it's over $500,000, of which $25,000 was allocated towards non-motorized transit. Okay. Of the $25,000, less than $10,000 was allocated towards the consultant fees. So the inter this is the energy block grant that we're That's talking correct. about. All right. And the energy block grant, in order for us to get this money, requires that we develop a plan. Mr. Mr. Zorn did not, and when he responded then, did not commit to adopting the plan. He committed to developing the plan. Now my question is, are we looking at federal funds right now that require us to adopt this plan? Well, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, as we move forward that we would have the ability to apply for uh, Department of Transportation Enhancement Funds, um, which are federally funded through the state to help implement this plan. And they require to have a plan in place. There might be other opportunities. So we have the funding from the past, the energy efficiency, which required a plan to be prepared. And then we have future funding opportunities from both the state and the federal government that require the plan to be adopted. Okay, they do require the plan to be adopted. That's correct. And they require that it be part of the master plan. Well, as I, I, I previously stated, the uh, Michigan uh, enabling, the uh, planning enabling, requires a comprehensive master plan for the community to be adopted every five years. Part of those are separate plans like the Parks and Recreation Master Plan, which also requires to be adopted every five years. As far as the state's concerned, that recreation plan does become a supplement to the overall comprehensive plan. The 
this non-motorized pathway and public transit plan as a supplement is part of the larger comprehensive plan. The city may choose to adopt other specific sub-area corridor plans, which are part of the overall master plan. So in the state's eyes, they see this as all as part of being their comprehensive plan. You really, you really didn't answer my question. You had compared it uh, previously in the conversation you and I had to the Parks and Recreation Plan being added as a supplement. That's but correct. the difference, the difference, and I'm getting to a point here because I want to ask for something in addition. The difference with Parks and Recreation ma uh, Plan, the master plan, we get a very detailed um, um, presentation and their plan doesn't, is not a general plan, their plan delineates this part, this, every, you know, this part, this part, and they are prioritized. Whether there will be redevelopment, a new, a new play set, or some new development to it, it's very, very detailed. This is a concept that we're talking about here. I mean, it's, I, I wouldn't, you can call it a plan, but to me it's a concept. What we would like all of these things to be incorporated in some way within the community. And all of these things we would like to have in some way. I mean, the concept to me is very good. My concern, personally, is we have situations in the west side of the city that are very different than the more, I would say, city type of community that we have on the east side of the city, where we have sidewalks, we have office buildings. Going to the west side, you have people that have 10 acre lots. And, you know, I, I feel that we really, to be honest with you, I feel that we didn't get the kind of presentation that I would have liked to have seen. I would have liked to have seen a PowerPoint. What we had was the, present, the presenter from the Greenway, um, the consultant, who gave us the same, pretty much the same thing as he had the first time he came in here. And I was hoping to see the type of uh, presentation where we really get into some of the meat of it because the website is so different. In, in what they want and what they expect and what we have on this side. And there are a lot of things in here that I can see being accepted in many neighborhoods, but not all, because not like we said earlier, not everyone wants sidewalks, even though not everyone wants them. It's just, you just can't change it. If the neighborhood doesn't want them, some people are not going to be happy. I really would like to have a more detailed discussion and more detailed presentation that would include that. But that's my, my preference, because I don't feel that we really had, I don't feel that we really had the kind of depth that we, that we could have had. But having said that, um, I guess I'm, I'm concerned that we, I'm not, I don't know that the federal funds are going to say you have to have it in the master plan. I'd like, I mean, if that happened, then I'd say, if, you know, if it, was, if it was a large grant that we really wanted, I'd say let's do it, but I'm, I'm just not, personally, I'm not ready to do that right now. But I like, I mean, the concepts are good. I'm not criticizing the concepts. The, the implementation of them is something that I think a lot of people have questioned here tonight, especially all the citizens. We don't have the money to do these things. It's going to be a very long range. Uh, when Mr. Lance said 20 years, I, I don't think that's uh, an unreasonable expectation given, given what we have to go through. But anyway, that's, I just wanted to find out that you answered some of my questions and one of them you didn't, that's all right. Um, I guess we are, uh, we have a motion of Mr. Steiger and a second by Mr. Frazier on adopting this as a uh, part of the master plan. And uh, Ms. Banks, I'm going to call for a roll call vote on this if you would. Excuse me, Madam Chair, I, I would vote on this, but I really would like to
analysis tonight to make it a part of the master plan. So that is the motion that's on the floor right now. I guess I'm either naive or confused. <clears throat> the way I see this, by passing this, it's a placeholder. What it is, it's a placeholder. There's no structure behind this other than the fact that uh, it becomes a supplement to the master plan. This is really no different than any other thing that we, as a council, would like to have set. If we want the um, Parks and Rec folks to come in and tell us what their priorities are, we ask them to come in and talk to us. If we want the planner to tell us what his priorities are, we ask the planner to come and talk to us. Same thing with public works or, or the building department. So tonight, all we're doing is, as far as I understand, is making a placeholder. The details come later. And that's, and I'm not disagreeing with any of the, the comments that the uh, Ms. Jordan or anyone else has said, because it's important. But right now, just to get it on the, uh, as a supplement, then we can talk about what's behind it, and then we give directions to what are the priorities that we agree are the ones. So tonight we're not going to, we're not putting anything in stone or anything else. It's just in the master as a supplement. We have a motion on the table by Mr. Steiger, supported by Mr. Spencer, and then a roll call vote in the same. Thank you. Ms. Jordan?
would ask the next available council study meeting that I could have appropriate amount of time to do this study. And I would be concerned if we had 15 other items on this coming meeting. I mean, I believe that within the next month or two, we could identify a date, working with the council president, so that we could do a full study session like we did a year ago. And I'd be happy to do that. What study is it? It's a brainstorm session. Just like I had before. Yes. And you would ask that we had appropriate time at that meeting. That's right. So I'm not on the 10th item, and then we have a two-hour meeting. That's all I'm asking. May 21st, which is a committee of the whole. That's fine. May 21st. May 21st? So the April 16th meeting? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I could be ready in April or May, whatever. I'll restate my motion. I will restate my motion. At the study session of April 16th, we will have a requesting a presentation from the planner to review the non-motorized walkway plan as well as his role and future direction. Future direction. Right. Thank you. If I may, thank you, Madam President. Yeah, this is GP 1235. This is an ordinance to amend Article 4, General Provision, by adding Section 5.60A, 5.60B, and 5.60C, entitled Green Energy Systems, Solar Energy Systems, and Geothermal Energy Systems, respectively. Since late last year, more coins have been placed on alternative energy systems in the city of Southfield. And in council's direction, staff and the planning commission have been working to develop regulations to govern wind energy and solar energy systems. The intent of the ordinance is to do three things. Promote safe, effective, and efficient use of these systems in order to reduce the consumption of fossil fuels in producing electricity. Preserve and protect public health, safety, welfare, and quality of life by minimizing the potential adverse effects these systems could pose. And establish standards, procedures for the siting, design, engineering, installation, operation, and maintenance of these systems. Wind energy systems in the ordinance fall into two categories. Horizontal turbines, which are the ones you're most familiar with, and vertical access turbines. These can be either structure-mounted or tower-mounted, and both are addressed within the ordinance. Structure-mounted turbines are just that. They are affixed to the side of or top of a building, while the tower-mounted system is affixed to a monopole similar to those that were constructed at the Silver Chevrolet site on Telegraph Road. Tower-mounted systems are broken down into small, medium, and large, and each has its own height requirement and allowable capacity. At your COW meeting of March 5th, when this was initially presented to you, there was a concern with regard to the allowance of small tower-mounted systems as permitted uses within the ordinance. Since that time, the ordinance has been revised by the Planning Department to make small tower-mounted systems special uses in all zoning districts. It was subject then to council approval after recommendation by the Planning Commission. There was also a question with regard to color of towers. I've done my research on that, and towers can be ordered in a variety of different colors. However, the most obtrusive color that is used is the color white, and that's why you see most of the white towers. Obtrusive or unobtrusive? Unobtrusive. Unobtrusive. Yes, it's the white tower. Regarding solar energy systems, the ordinance covers both structure-mounted and ground-mounted. 
Uh, again, at your COW meeting on March 5th, there was a concern uh, raised with regard to ground mounting systems in the front yards of, of property. Uh, staff has revised the section and ground mounting systems are now allowed only in the side and rear yards, which means a ground mounted solar energy system would not be allowed in the front yard. Uh, this ordinance has been reviewed by the legal department of the building and our comments have been incorporated in the draft ordinance before you this evening. The Planning Commission has a public hearing forwarded a favorable recommendation to City Council and the Planning Department is recommending approval of the draft ordinance before you this evening for the reasons stated within the resolution. Thank you. Zero P.O. Box 155, Southfield, Michigan 48037-0155. My telephone number is 248-3529188. Um, I'm in support of this zoning ordinance because we had an issue with our first totally green uh, business, which happened to be a car dealership, and the fact that they wanted to do a very green business. On a previous occasion, I had spoke to one of the planning commissioners, um, which is a volunteer position. Are we closed? Is the meeting over? Last call. Yeah. Oh, okay. Last call, all right. <laughs> Good one, my rephrase. <laughs> but anyway, I had spoke to um, one of the uh, planning commissioners, and um, there is a wind turbine on the top of a house somewhere on Southfield Road. Now we talk about this grandfathering in with code enforcement. We talk about this uh, wind turbine on the top of a house. You can't put it in the front yard. You can't put it in the backyard. Can you stay in this ordinance if you're going to allow residents to use it? Can it be mounted on the house in the backyard, proximity of another neighbor's backyard? And can we also add in there something about a fence ordinance? Um, I've been talking to Mr. Terry Crows, and it just seems like with new businesses, we're requiring for them to put up brick walls, concrete posted panel walls, but we're not looking at some of these really shabby fences that this city approved businesses to do, which you're calling in your, in your plans a six-foot decorative fence. And I'll be more specific, the fence that separates Tail 12 Mall from the, du uh, the dwelling that's behind there. They put up a six-foot wooden fence. It falls apart when it rains and storms really hard. The fence is currently down. Um, I talked about the city having a, an ordinance and allowing a concrete post and panel or brick wall to separate those developments to act as a real barrier. So I want you to include that in there and to address the uh, issue of a fence ordinance. Thank you.
Stephanie English, 28735 San Carlos, South Bend, Michigan, 40076. I would just uh, like to hear more uh, dialogue and inputs pertaining to the geothermal system and uh, to ensure that um, Mr. Spence has uh, the same protection about uh, neighbors that may install those systems. Um, I think that he's done a good job in terms of protecting the integrity or the look of the neighborhood if solar panels are placed on a residence and that they have to be in the rear or at the side of the uh, yard. But the geothermal uh, installations with the U-joint installations, that can possibly place uh, some havoc in terms of the look if they're designed on a home. Um, the U-joint systems uh, primarily are underground, but the construction of them can be a little bit invasive and they are hooked to other electrical systems that may be attached to the actual structure of the home. So again, in terms of protecting the integrity, I wanted to ask through the chair if uh, the same uh, look protections are there, you know, for neighbors um, who might have other neighbors that install the geothermal systems. Yeah, if, if I may, uh, within the ordinance itself, the geothermal section is in reserve, but we are currently studying that, but obviously those are good points, and uh, as we move forward here, we'll, we will be bringing forward eventually geothermal regulations. Okay, well. and the little so, and you get what I'm saying in terms of the protection for adjoining neighbors that may not have those systems, and the progressive neighbor who does install, that there could be some impact in terms of their visual um, uh, you know, there's civil rights in terms of what they're viewing on their neighbors' homes. Yeah, okay. they will look into that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do we uh, have the, do they allow, I mean, they allow to install them without permission from the city? The geothermal system? Yeah. Uh, if you recall, LPU does have a geothermal system. Right, yeah. and we're talking about residential. Yeah. Yeah, as it stands right now, again, we don't have regulations don't have for them, but again, we realize we are in a moratorium as well. Uh, Fred Boker, 24201 Garner. I'd like to applaud the city for taking a step into the 21st century. We're decades behind in technology. We have Lawrence Tech here. We should have had wind turbines paying down the cost of schools down the cost of this city. There's as much wind as blows through here. Uh, we could we could operate a few fans over this over this uh, building itself and uh, catch some of the BTUs as it were created by the hot and uh, sometimes uh, BTU creative uh, heat that, 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 that gets exchanged over going into the 21st century or keeping it so often as we hear in Southfield, the way it was, or the way it is, even to the point of bike paths being invasive into what I thought we decided 20 years ago was the West Telegraph Summit, an issue that would keep the west side of Telegraph rural. And I don't think these, uh, these solar slash wind power, I've been heating with solar for 30 years. I have a house that faces the south. I put windows everywhere I could on the south side of the house. I don't turn the, I turn the furnace off in February, then the sun starts to heat the house. It's not a difficult retrofit. As for the permitting, that it will follow up the rapid installation of an ever-increasing market. We should be asking Lawrence Tech for some of their brightest and some of their best to compete and retrofit along with Habitat for Humanity, perhaps, a house that could live or could exist off the grid and contain enough viable gathering ability from wind, heat, solar, etc., cetera, to, to, to reduce the, even more so than the wind turbines of today, even more so the reliance on carbon and, and nuclear as, a, as a, a foreteller of our fate. These things are running on borrowed time, and I think that upgrading the city is, is, is a positive step. It's great, and I'm glad that in this 2012, finally, we're entering into the 21st century with this adaptation towards alternative sources of power. Thank you. Okay. Greg Keeling, 25170 Circle Drive. One of the things I do every day is I go to people's homes and teach them about energy efficiency. One of the things I've done for two years is I've talked to energy audit. One of the things I've done with some of the people from the city of Southfield is talk about energy and different plans and programs. 
different things that are going on throughout the state. I work for one of the companies, that's what their main policy is doing. So I consult on this. I consulted with um, Southfield Hope about putting in a geothermal system, but I told them to wait on because the city of Southfield was possibly looking at putting one and going down Civic Center Road possibly. So that we'd be able to tie into all the business, which would make a great business plan for making money for the city, bringing companies into the city. But at the same time, as we're looking at this and we're saying, no, we don't want to have solar panels or solar stuff on the front of the house. So if I have a solar roof with solar panels sitting on the front of it, you're telling me I can't have I can't have shingles on top of my house that are going to grab this? And if that's the way the sun is going to migrate across my house, I'm going to be eliminated because it's not going to be that way. My house, for me to get solar rays, will be on the west side of my house. It's hitting the side of my garage. So when you're thinking about these things, maybe you might want to consult somebody that does this type of work before you decide, well, we don't want to do it this way, we don't want to do it that way, and you don't know all the products that are out there for you and all the different ways there are for you. I had an uh, issue with Jerry, me and Jerry, we came to a discussion on one of the, after one of the fines when he found out, no, I was the guy that was able to take his house off the grid via my van that they kept wanting to write up for a flat tire. I'm like, no, I'm using it for a generator. Well, you can't use it for a generator. Why not? Why can't I use it for a power plant? Are you a stationary engineer? No. I am. You want me to tell you how I can do it? You want me to tell you how any stationary engineer that wanted to do it can do it simply and easily? So I think you should convert, con, con, talk to some people that know what they're doing before you do this. Like I said, once again, this is something I do every day. Not just part time, not just think about it. Thank you. If I may, through the chair, yeah, the, the item that we are talking about is a ground mounted system. Now, we're not talking about roof systems. We're talking about right. those that would be on the ground in the front yard, right. not on the roof. It was, it was not on the roof, it was on the ground. Do you understand that? You were talking about the roof. I can do both, roof or on the ground. But what I can do a solar furnace on the ground off the side of my garage. Just because Kevin said they did not want the solar panels on the front lawn. Okay, in the front lawn? Okay. All right. That was it.
cooperating with other communities. Um, so it would be, a, to me, it would be something that uh, we'd at least, we ought to at least take a look at and see if there's a, if we can get some cooperation from the other communities around us. Because I don't think we're that much different. Sun in the uh, Oak Park's only about mid and a quarter difference in the Disney Sunday. I wanted to tell uh, Terry when we had a conversation last week about this, um, this ordinance, and you gave me, uh, I was asking about the research done on it. You said that you've gone to the state of all kinds of uh, groups. Do you want to, you know, that might be helpful to mention that at this time. I'm going to let Mr. Spence respond to you that. Remember the and then, yes, exactly. Right. And then I'll jump in. So that would be the research on the standards that we uh, use. I'll, I'll respond and then Mr. Spence can talk about it. Okay. Um, we researched the national best practices, the Planning Advisory Service, and American Planning Association for, for best practices. We also um, researched the state guidelines and the model ordinance, mm -hmm. as well as several local community ordinances. Now that all being said, um, Mr. Frazier, we try to take the best that fits for Southfield. And as you recall, uh, when Sarah Chevrolet came in, we did not have anything on the books. They went through as a special use, and we were able to incorporate some best practices at that time, and the direction from the council was come back with an ordinance. You, as council, created a moratorium only on wind turbines. As we were doing our research, we realized there's a bigger picture here and we've thus called it Sustainable Energy Ordinance. So we have uh, a starting point with the wind turbine and solar panels, and we have to continue to do work on the geothermal. But at least we'll have something on the books, and then we can reach out to adjoining communities now and compare notes. Some do have various levels of this ordinance, some have none at all, and, and it's a good idea, but we have to protect our city first, and, and that's why we, we're using this as a starting point. I would imagine that this will evolve over time as we test things out. Public Act 110 is amended. 
with an Article 4 general provision of Chapter 45 zoning of the Code of the City of Southfield. Article 3. Madam President, my name is Gerard Mullen. Since 1968, I have lived at 17 Lee Street, and since 1961, I have worked in the city of Detroit, the city of Southfield. Excuse me. I'm pleased to see that after more than three months, the city of Southfield has finally decided to address the problem of the planning department's bad habit of publishing improper legal notices. I first raised this question on December 14, 2011, at the Planning Commission's hearing in reference to GP 1232. Check the minutes. I revisited this issue with Council on January 23, 2012, and again on February 13, 2012. And now we are here tonight on March 19, 2012. Sad to say, Council's legal notice published for this public hearing to fix the improper legal notices problem is in itself improper. That is, Council's attempt to revise a section that doesn't exist, namely Section 5.221. There is no Section 5.221. There is no Section 5.221. Check it out, check it out. Council, council can't do anything right. Council can't be trusted. Council has no standards. Trust me, I'm right on this one again. Like I was right on December 14th, and on January 23rd, and on February 13th. The council again and again and again repeatedly screws up when it comes to legal notices. This time, big time, and prime time. Therefore, council's legal notice for this public hearing is improper. To be, per, to be very precise, Council's notice violates PA 110, Article 1, Section 103, Subsection 4A. Check it out. Check it out. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you.
through administrative review, through planning commission review, with the proper notice requirements to get to council, and that's why it's taken this long. So I do really noted your, your comment. We feel that we haven't found proper procedure. This just cleans up some antiquated okay. language in the book. I was going to make it easy. Then you don't have to remember for the daylight savings standard research standard time. It's, uh, it was 7 o'clock or 6, whatever time the, the meeting is at, at local time. So. I think Mr. Obama wants to go to the Well, it is in the book. I'm right. Can I speak? No. But I'm right. I, I see that, but that's what but you're holding up. Our planner says he has it and we have it, so it's, it's, in the, it's in your record. You can double check it. <laughs> there is a section 5.221 entitled special use procedure in Article 4 of the general provisions. I am also looking at it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have a motion by Mr. Cyrus or by Mr. Frazier. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion is carried. We need another. We need another ordinance. Ordinance. 5059. Okay. What was the ordinance? That is correct. <laughs> I move that we introduce ordinance number 1591. Support. Motion by Mr. Frazier. Support by Mr. Jordan. That ordinance number 1591 is approved. All in favor? Aye. 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 All those motions have carried. Mm -hmm. There are no site plans. Mm -hmm. We're going to
the language perfectly. Now, this grant came through in February of last year. We still have not accepted the grant. We need that grant. We need firefighters. We need a strong public safety. Just like we need to accept that, that safer grant to augment our staff, we also need a police contract. We also need to settle those grievances. We need a police chief. Our firefighters and police officers should not have to worry about doing their job with all of this administrative stuff. Now let me remind you guys the concessions that the firefighters took to make this grant easy for you to accept. The firefighters pay a premium copay on their insurance plus a $1,500 deductible. Now, they're putting 5% in their pension for contributions. There's this two-tier system, which basically states that people that hire in in the future won't get retiree health care. The city will contribute to a fund monthly toward the buyout. Their pension multiplier is lower, which basically means they have to work longer just to come out with some sort of uh, uh, pension. Now, I know, and I'm going to compliment Mr. Charette for saying at the last COW meeting that the city was trying to reconfigure. I also did a FOIA to get the narrative from the Southfield Fire Department and also FEMA's article or agreement article. At no time did FEMA say that you could not, with written approval, ask to have that grant reconfigured. I will say it again and again and again. This city used that SAFER grant to market that millage because you knew if we did not pass that millage, we would only have enough money probably until August, maybe July we would be facing an emergency financial manager. Now, since they took concessions to make it easier to accept this grant, it would be nice to get five firefighters, but it would be brilliant to take all 11. I've stated before, Kelly Services, when they hire you for a job, they tell you how long that contract is for. And they tell you that it's up to the people to retain you. So do the right thing and accept the safer grant. Eleven firefighters. Thank you. Is my time up? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh.
defense and say, well, they commit crimes against me. Suddenly it's not a crime the to the city attorney. In fact, when the Southfield police get in trouble, they run to the city attorney and say, hey, protect us. And the city attorney doesn't challenge it in any way. All the city attorney does is say that we'll just take whatever you say and believe it and present it to the judge. There's no decline to prosecute by the city attorney that you find in other cities and other jurisdictions that actually challenge the allegations in the public police. For instance, in the city of Detroit, they don't prosecute every allegation made by the police. They actually look at the facts and they look at the evidence and look to see if there's an actual crime there. But that doesn't happen in Southfield. So in a sense, we're paying these high taxes and we're getting low service. It's like we're paying for a Jaguar, but if we're getting a July. And then so the city attorney takes the charges to the judge. The judge, of course, believes whatever the city attorney says because they both afraid of the Southfield police. Because the Southfield police have the guns and they're the threat to the community. And so the judge moves forward on charges that have no sense, no basis, no facts, no evidence. And so I've been through this for years by the Southfield police and the city attorney beginning in 2009. They've wasted an immense amount of time and resources. It makes me kind of wonder, well, if they consider me a criminal, then what are they doing with the rest of their time? And I beat them. And I don't get a paycheck. I don't get pension. I don't get benefits. I don't get free late model cars. I don't get free board all gas. And I beat them repeatedly because they're not competent. They're cowardly. I've had the Southfield police tell me repeatedly, oh, we fear for our safety. You people are dangerous. And I say, us people, eh? Okay. Because the Southfield police don't see us as part of the community. They see us as a threat. And they treat us like a threat. And so when you go into uh, the courts and when you go in before the city attorney, they don't want to hear what you have to say. And I look at 46th District Court and I realize it's a grand extortion scheme. Because there's not enough crime to justify the salaries and the, and the budgets and the manpower of the Southfield police. So they have to make work for themselves. And I look at the Southfield, uh, what's it, in the Southfield Courts, 46th District Court, and I see who's accused there. And I see that it's mostly penny adding, nickel and dime stuff that has nothing to do with public safety. It's just a way to make the innocent into the guilty and to give themselves the justification for their paychecks and for their jobs and for what they're doing. There's no justice in 46th District Court. They use intimidation, harassment to make sure that you do exactly what they want you to do, regardless of whether they're facts or evidence to support it. The only way I can find any justice in Southfield by going before a jury or people from the community because they have no vested interest in whether or not I'm guilty or not. The court gets paid in looking for conviction. If you're accused by Southfield police, everybody's going to make sure that you know that you are guilty regardless of whether the facts of the evidence support it. So you have the, the city attorney making sure that she gets convictions that look good or he or whoever the city attorney is. He. Um, you have the judges getting fined and costs to justify their existence, and then you have the Southfield police talking about how dangerous the community is. Well, I see children playing in the street, and I see old people walking, and they don't seem like they're scared, so I wonder where this great danger is, and why the Southfield police seem to be out of touch. And it's a certain kind of Southfield police. I haven't had any problem with the Southfield uh, police women, or police, uh, with female, no problem whatsoever. And, uh, but repeatedly I see Southfield police who do not look like me. They treat me disrespectfully. I've had Southfield police come in my house and I told them to get out. They don't respect me in my own home. Even Jesus Christ, I don't think, would uh, tell, say that he has the right to be in my home when I tell him to leave. But the Southfield police, I guess, believe they're greater than Jesus Christ. If I had Southfield police, saw Southfield police who looked like me in my community, I think there would be a much, much better response uh, from them instead of the, the condescension, the hostility that I get from the Southfield police currently. I mean, they look like criminals to me, considering all the criminal activities committed against me. And it's all to protect Bank of America. Bank of America is the biggest threat to Southfield. Any greater, greater than any, uh, any uh, uh, criminal, because Southfield Bank, uh, Bank of America destroys neighborhoods. They're a bailout bank, a predator bank. The greatest failure, commercial failure known to man. I don't know why anybody would do business with a failure like Bank of America. And they're not from Michigan. They have absolutely no interest in, in the well-being of South. I don't even know why they're even here. Stephanie English, 287-35 San Carlos, Southfield, Michigan, 48076. 
I'm coming here this evening um, to actually do a conclusion to uh, the concerns of the Southfield Police Department that uh, they've asked me to push forward since November. Um, actually, some things have transpired since my request to speak here where I had two meetings with our city administrator and our city attorney pertaining to these concerns. I believe that uh, that situation in terms of the information that I presented was handled fairly. Um, I was going to do a formal citizen uh, internal investigation complaint per PR 8.02 section 4B. However, um, I believe that the meeting that I had with them where I could actually give uh, the documentation that I had obtained from the city was relevant and the dialogue between us was fair. I'd like to address through the chair or just this common body to the police officers themselves that they are going to have to come forward directly themselves with presenting some of the information that they've asked me to. I do have uh, a concern that they are concerned about retaliatory and punitive reactions from uh, police Brian Gerald who these allegations were against, but that is something that I believe the city administrator and the city attorney are going to address. I believe it will be fair and it will be appropriate and there will be the proper transparency that these officers need. Um, I believe that their concerns are such that they want to have uh, a safe sanctuary to bring these uh, um, concerns forward where, again, there will be no punitive action against them, but if there is going to be the proper investigation. Um, uh, the last uh, issue that I had checked was the alleged uh, misuse of vendors against uh, from the uh, uh, police chief in question. I did present to our city attorney and our city administrator uh, the um, accounts payable. I had asked for a detailed list of all work done by the vendor between July 2011 and December 31st, 2011, because allegedly um, the improper behaviors occurred on November 29th and 30th. I'm not going to use this form to go through all of the details, but I just want the officers to hear me if they can, that I appreciate their confidence and hope that I serve them well in terms of uh, standing strong. It was not easy to do. I felt disrespect from Ms. Seymour consistently. Um, I felt disparate treatment and discriminating treatment in comparison to others that came to this line. Um, I feel that she did not regard me respectfully. Um, it just bordered on racism, and I'm going to throw that word out because I was looking at me being a black female resident, some of the white male residents who would come after me and be treated in a better manner, given more time to speak, and their questions answered. That's okay because the most important people at this point to determine the problem are the city administrator and the city attorney. I do want to thank the council person that invited me in to hear the concerns of these officers. That would be Mr. Moss, Ms. Jordan, Mr. Lance, and Mr. Cyber. I believe that they gave a fair forum to listen to this information. The officers deserve the respect to be heard. Um, these were not trite issues. We vetted every single allegation as thoroughly as possible. Um, I would do it again, even facing, again, what I consider disparate impact from the council president. It's not fair that even if I bring something controversial to the forum, that I should not be respected like any other a citizen that comes forward. Um, I do want to address Mr. Charette and um, Ms. Ward that those meetings were conducive, and I do believe that the outcome is going to be good, where there will be, where they will be building a bridge of communication and again safe sanctuary where the police officers have a voice to push any of their concerns forward. If their upper management is doing something that is improper, illegal, or without the integrity that a police leader should have. Um, I want to thank them for their time uh, with doing that and hopefully that that will go forward. Again, I thank all of the officers. Um, I believe in their service. Um, sometimes all employee groups have bad apples, but that does not mean that the whole body is, is, is not a body to be respected. And our officers did deserve a voice if they did not feel comfortable that they could dissuade. I believe them. That's why I took a stand. Sometimes you have to champion a culture change, and those change masters are sometimes the ones that are controversial. I respect the city processes. I hope that I presented the officer's concern in a respectful manner uh, with some logic, with, with um, facts in terms of checking off the information. But in concluding, the officers have to themselves come and be willing to testify and hopefully that sanctuary 
will be created so that there is that communica communication channel that's open.
sorry? Can I hear? No. No what? She's not going to respond. She's not going to respond? That's right. Are we going to die for pay? <laughs> is this the voice of justice? This is just us. There's no justice here. It's just us waiting for an answer, and she won't answer me. Is that your approval? With your approval, Jay? 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 Mr. Butler, your time is up. Please sit down. Your time is up. And it ends on a question I've asked, not being she's allowed not to be answered. That's right. She's not able to answer you. She's what? She's not going to be able to answer you. Will you please sit down? With official record, she's that's not right. able to answer me. That is correct. Or not willing. Is it not willing or not able? She's not going to answer you.
volunteers for our emergency um, services, we use volunteers for our practice, we use volunteers for our practice <coughs> as planning commission and only board. One of the most powerful commissions we have are all volunteers. So why couldn't we have the ones in the community to, to, to do this? But I, w- I, w- I, want, I want whoever goes there to be empowered to say that's what we want. Yeah, just adding on to that. The if I if I heard if I remember correctly, the original concept of the Total Living Commission was sort of like an adjunct uh, com- commission to the council. They spoke to the, the they were in between us and the neighbors, so they would find out what was going on and then report back to us, kind of. And lately, it, you know, they've had their own agenda and they. Uh, Periodically, they should be coming to us to uh, uh, bring us up to date on what they're going on and make a two-way conversation. Because actually, in these minutes, it says they're determining if the program is needed or not.
the interrupters. And uh, the name of the interrupters and uh, what it, it amounts to an uh, ex gang member who <coughs> spent time in prison, but have seen a different way to look at that. Work with current gang members in neighborhoods that are, that are troubled neighborhoods and try to work with the young people and, and part of just whoever it is in the neighborhood and, uh, and try to get them to resolve issues without uh, pulling out guys and guns. But I have the video, I, I'm watching myself. Anyone else? Thank you. Um, Council, there's a, a lot going on in the city and those who are listening. I just want to highlight some of them. We are going to have our just date. It's going to have its grand opening within the next week or so. Uh, we're very excited about that. That's the Cupcake Store. It will be on Evergreen Road, so that's a new addition to the city. <coughs> on Tuesday of last week, I was able to attend the South Mill High National Honor Society program. Nothing is more touching than to see these young scholars who are amazing leaders in their right already. And with now the children being able to take college credit while they enroll in high school, not only do they talk about them being a junior, but they have also accumulated X amount of uh, credit already in college. And I'm always impressed by the uh, the young people and, and, and how amazing they are. But speaking about youth, we had our battle over books, and it continues to be one of the most exciting places in Southfield. These kids were just excited as they were 10 years ago uh, when they competed. Uh, it was wonderful, and it's good to see that Southfield and our library is continuing that tradition. It, it means so much for us to promote learning and reading, and uh, it, it was just wonderful, wonderful event. And the parents are just as proud as the kids. They're just as competitive. So it was great. I also want to acknowledge uh, the Kiva Hebrew Day School who had their annual uh, event. It was on Sunday, March 18th. As we know, Akiva is uh, located in South Hill. And the pride of that school and that community was evident as always. And I was honored to be there with them as they celebrated um, and fundraise for their uh, for their children. Um, I always uh, the city always has a state of the city which I had already, but but that is an event that's during the day and it's due to the chamber. So I started a tradition of having a community state of the city, excuse me, community state of the city, which will be Tuesday, March twentieth, which will kick off my annual mayor's um, round table. And so um, it will be March, Tuesday, March 20th at 7 p.m. in the library meeting room, and I invite the community to come out for that. We are going to have our annual blood drive. It will be Wednesday, March 21st, and it will be at the pavilion. We encourage the city to come out to participate in that blood drive. Also, uh, Channel 7 has partnered with us with Project Healthy Living uh, for a number of years, and this year it's going to be Tuesday. March 27th, and you can come and get health screening uh, for free. Some of them is a small fee, but it is an amazing opportunity. A lot of our seniors and those who um, just want to come in and take advantage of free or low um, health screening, that's going to be a partnership with Channel 7 we've done for a number of years. And lastly, uh, OCC, we talked about the millions of dollars in renovation that they have put into their campus. The first is a lawsuit brought by a new place to law, PLC, City. It's involved in a lawyer request that was made to the city council. Specifically labeled and treated as non public records under a Michigan statute. They involve some police matters. And uh, on that basis, the FOIA request was denied, and um, this uh, law firm has now brought a, a, an action in the Oakland County Circuit Court against the city seeking to, uh, to obtain those records. So we're asking that uh, we be allowed to defend that matter. The second matter is a uh, uh, automobile accident, which... So you think what did you think? So moved. 
motion by Mr. Frazier, supported by Ms. Jordan, that we authorize the city attorney to take over the action of the city in this case. Mr. Tyler? Mr. Ward, is this about an ongoing investigation, an open investigation in the police department? It is not an open investigation. It was a criminal matter. There was a plea of that criminal matter, but it was taken under a provision of a statute, which then says that that plea and the associated documents, the arrest records and all of those documents, are now non-public. So specifically by statute, they are held by the Michigan State Police as non-public records. I know that the law speaks to ongoing investigations. Correct. And under just the general FOIA, that would be true. This is another statute that says specifically this type of action is non-public. Thank you. The second matter of precedent involves an automobile accident in which one of our police officers was operating the vehicle. There was a collision, and the plaintiff is indicating that he was injured as a result of that accident. So again, we're asking that we be allowed to take whatever action necessary. Motion by Mr. Frazier, supported by Ms. Jordan. Mr. Frazier, can you take whatever action necessary to defend the city? Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. The next item before you is a request from the Friends of the South Hill Public Library for a gaming license. The purpose of this license is to facilitate the raffle. The organization will be holding a hands-off to South Hill with Mr. Song, Melanie, along with a raffle on Thursday, April 25th, 2012, in the South Hill Public Library main room. The State of Michigan's Charitable Gaming Division requires that council adopt a resolution recognizing the Friends of the South Hill Public Library as a non-profit organization. All the necessary paperwork is attached, and it is recommended that your honorable body adopt a resolution recognizing the Friends of the South Hill Public Library as a non-profit organization for the purpose of obtaining a gaming license. Motion by Mr. Frazier, supported by Mr. Frazier. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you. We have no further business.